Live from Union Square in the heart of San Francisco, it's theCUBE covering Spark Summit 2016. Brought to you by Databricks and IBM. Now here are your hosts, John Walls and George Gilbert. And welcome back to Spark Summit 2016 here on theCUBE. Our coverage continues here at the Hilton, just outside the Expo Pavilion here, what is still a very, very busy show floor. Uh, really, again, um, just a tremendous expression of the support and the enthusiasm behind the Spark and what's happening right now in the enterprise here in 2016. I'm John Walls along with George Gilbert and we're joined now by Christopher Wynn, who is the co-founder and CEO of Arimo, uh, which is a company that's really focused on intelligence augmentation in the enterprise, and I'm really curious, Christopher, to hear about intelligence augmentation, but first, uh, welcome. Nice to have you here. Well, thank you, John. We appreciate that. Tell us first off, I'm curious, just your thoughts. So you've been here, uh, uh, keynotes this morning, a lot of excitement around that, jam-packed uh, auditorium. Just your thoughts about seeing this kind of, um, I don't know, enthusiasm, if you will, around mm -hmm. Spark and what's happening in this community right now. Well, the perspective I have is, is as a very early adopter of, of Spark. Uh, I remember when we were sitting at an Amp Lab room, just you know, basically at the time when we said we were going to bet the company on on Spark, there was no, it wasn't even an Apache project yet, um, and basically well, there was just Yahoo, Conviva, which is Jan Stoichkov's company, and at that time us, and um, to see that the, the first Spark conference that we did was in December 2013. The whole program fit on not even an eight and a half or 11 sheet. You know, there was like maybe 10, 20 presenters and we were one of them. And to see it grow so rapidly to the scale that it has today, I believe Microsoft has now gotten on board with you know, supporting Spark in, in their cloud solution. It's just amazing. Yeah, yeah you know, and you were saying that, I mean, you kind of bet the ranch early, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, which was really uh, That's right. a pretty bold step. And of course, your company focusing on big data, machine learning, uh, backed by uh, Andreessen Horowitz. Um, but making that commitment, you know, mm -hmm. back when, like I said, back in the project phase even, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, what was it that, that you saw or that you had a sense about what was about to happen that you put all your chips on the table? Well, if you are familiar with technology evolution and then you understand architecture and you have a sense of timing, then it's actually not a very risky bet. You know, what's, what's risky for one you know, person may not be as risky for the other if you have information asymmetry. And the information asymmetry that we had looking at Spark is that we looked at a whole bunch of different compute, big compute architectures, specifically in memory. Uh, and we know, you know, I, I used to spend time at Google looking from the outside, looking at solutions that people were coming up like Hive, which is trying to put a SQL layer on top of MapReduce, and we knew that that was the incorrect approach. And so we were going to build uh, a layer of in-memory in, in processing. Um, and we knew that, that what had to happen is that you need to have what's called a distributed data set that exists outside of the compute cycle. If you think about the map reduce map paradigm, you only have data uh, existing when there is some compute going on. Spark is unique in that it has a concept of RDD. And RDDs exist whether there's compute cycle or not. And what we wanted to do is to build an interactive application on top of such a compute system. And you can't do that without having this, the data, the, this di distributed data set. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the key things about the Spark architecture that we knew was necessary. Mm -hmm. The other part is really about timing. If you draw a chart, Moore's law about cost of, in, of memory. Um, over the last 50 years, it's exactly, you know, essentially halving every 18 months. And so, if you think about at places like Google and even earlier Wall Street, when people were using a lot of in-memory in HPC high-performance computers, it was worth it because every stock tick was millions of dollars on the line. It does take time for memory to drop to a level that's cheap enough for enterprises to say, okay, now we can deploy it at scale. And so Spark came on the scene just at the right time for that to happen. And a lot of news being made here by various companies. You had some announcements as well. Um, why don't you shed 
a little light on that for us and, and with our audience as well with what kind of news yeah. you're making today. Well, uh, I'm, I'm here for a couple of reasons. Number one is that we have a paper we're presenting tomorrow, and then I'm also on the Spark Technology Council so for, for the meeting to help set some of the direction uh, for that. The, the paper we're presenting is fairly esoteric. It's in the data science track. Uh, the title is uh, Bayesian Optimization for Automatic Hyperparameter Optimization. And so what... what Unpack that for us. Is that right. about helping to... If I, if I saw some of your notes, it's helping to automatically find features for a model? Exactly. So if you, are, if you think about the life of a data scientist, essentially the, the task is to build predictive models from data. And so when, when you're a data scientist and you do that, a lot of times you run these, the data through various algorithms and you have to tweak, there's dials on these algorithms that, that are called hyperparameters. For example, the learning rate, you got to pick that uh, to get a good model. Now, for the most part, when a data scientist does this, it's pretty much a manual process. It's a lot of guesswork based on experience. And so, uh, it turns out that takes a lot of time. You know, the, the training itself is run by large-scale computing system like Spark, but the choice of her parameters and then waiting one cycle and trying the next one, that, if there's a way to automate it, then but that could save a lot of time and effort. This is, this is, I mean, all of this is rocket science, but this is like rocket science taking off from the moon because you're turning the machine learning process onto the machine learning process itself. That, that's right, that's right. And, and right. the idea that we're going to augment and make more productive the scarce asset called data scientists. Mm -hmm. But help relate that, help, help us relate that back to the, the product you're, you're working on, um, if, if that is in fact related. It it's absolutely is related. Our overarching goal at Arimo is something we call intelligence augmentation. And what that means is that we augment human intelligence with machine intelligence in the enterprise. So what we just talked about is one example of intelligence augmentation. That is, the data scientist is a human intelligence. And the data scientist would never go away, just like accountants didn't go away because of Excel. Uh, but what we're enabling is for the data scientist skills and time to be leveraged so that he or she can focus on the higher end task while the very tedious task of things like parameter, you know, hyperparameter searching should be done through other machine learning algorithms. So how, now help, help tie that back to the product you're starting to roll out or to unveil. Right, so our product suite uh, has two major human targets. Uh, one is the business user, the other is the data scientist. Um, so the value proposition that we bring to these two groups, there are three. For the business user, we allow the business user to go to a web interface, a document, we call it a narrative, and type in a natural language question like forecast the next 30 days of revenues and have the answer come back within 10 seconds. And so in order to answer that question, you need a lot of predictive uh, models and the computing power and the data processing uh, required to do that. For the data scientist, as we've just talked about, for example, we provide ways to make the data scientists a lot more productive. And we also work on deep learning algorithms so that there are new ways that the data scientists can use to, for example, something I'm very excited about is time series processing. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, the third value proposition that we give to the human, you know, the, the business user and the data scientist is the collaboration between these two. So there should not be silos of software that the business user uses BI and the data scientist uses you know, esoteric Python or R. The value for, to the enterprise is, is expressed or is most you know, leveraged when these two have a, a common environment and express their unique skills. So a data scientist can work in the same environment and type R or SQL or Python while a business user is working with natural language and they're working on the same data set. That's, that's the key value that, that, that we so, provide. So you're, you're talking about intelligence augmentation, so IA, mm -hmm. and then we have AI, you know, artificial intelligence. I mean, I mean what, what's the distinction between the two and, and how, it sounds like they, there's an overlap there basically, right? Yeah. You're using one to kind of create the other. There's, there's sort of an interesting sort of philosophical debate, right? 
is AI going to become super human intelligent and take over the planet? Uh, uh, and you know, you've got people like Elon Musk saying that this is uh, you know uh, raising the devil. And the great goo theory. That's right. We're now we're all going to turn into a goop. I, I am actually of the school <laughs> of thought where I, I think the concern is warranted. Right, uh, seeing the trends of where we're going, I, I think it's not wise to ignore the trend. Uh, on the other, to, to ignore the trend. Yeah. Uh, so it is a very important to take it seriously. On the other hand, I think that as a species, we are smart enough to apply intelligent augmentation. That we will augment our own human intelligence with machine intelligence, and there are going to be three phases of that. So the first phase is everything that we just talked about, right? We're using machine learning, deep learning algorithms to extend human abilities. In the second phase, we're going to do this, what, something what we call pervasive data science, meaning every API, every input box, everything in the enterprise will be machine learning able, far more than what we're seeing today in, in terms of specific applications. Would it be fair to say the, the um, whole design time tool chain would be automated? by the runtime tool chain? Yes, I, I think certainly automation of that using machine learning is, is a key. Uh, even more significantly, uh, take the example of an input box. Like let's say you have a mobile application and you type in and it's asking for your first name or your last name. Today, that, the software behind processing that input is actually very dumb, right? It may do some validation and the validation to make sure that you've typed in a, a, a name and not some random sequence of characters that may do what's called SQL injection attack, right? You might type in some escape sequence and then the command to delete the database in the back end. And so some programmer somewhere has to write a rule that says, watch out for a particular pattern, and if it's not, it doesn't fit that pattern, then reject the input. If you think about it in terms of common sense, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, we'll ask the question, well, wh why, do, why are machines so dumb? Why can't they just see that it's clearly not a first name? And it's because they don't have common sense. And the reason they don't have common sense is because there's no learning behind it. And so imagine the day when everything behind every API, every microservice, there's a machine learning algorithm running that, there's a brain running it. So, so who's using IA now? I mean, uh, I mean how do you, how's it being applied? And, and what do you see are the, uh, the short-term and the, and the long-term benefits? Which you, you've kind of touched on a little bit of that. But right. Yeah. So our customers uh, range from retailers to, to manufacturers to financial institutions. Um, in the case of retail, for example, there are a number of use cases that, that, that we've deployed. Um, one is internal and the other is external. The internal is essentially the enterprise user. The external is that they are putting our software to essentially new product and new product features. For the internal case, it is a marketing manager sitting down in front of Remo and saying, forecast the right level of inventory I should put into this particular store at that particular time, using all of the data available. For the external use case, uh, we're helping a, uh, looking at a, a sequence of customer interactions as a time series data and cluster or segment customers based on observations of what they do as opposed to you know, who they are. Mm -hmm. If you think about customer segmentation today, it's very much we look at what we call cross-sectional data or CRM data, mm -hmm. right? Based on height, you know, age, religion, income, and so on. But it turns out watching what people do as a, as a time series of their actions is far more predictive of what they're about to do next. So it's it's behavioral instead of dem demographic? Exactly, behavioral as opposed to, to, to sort of cross-sectional characteristics. Hey, can you apply that maybe on e-commerce, but I mean, uh, healthcare, you know, looking, somehow mapping out those behaviors and, and yeah. trying to cite where there might be issues or better outcomes, things like that? Yes, certainly in healthcare, I, I guess, you know, what you say reminds me of the, 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 the insurance uh, industry, like, like uh, Medicare payments and so on, and fraud detection. And fraud detection can also benefit significantly from this time series analysis using deep learning. That is, rather than issuing a whole bunch of rules that say when, you know, payments cross certain thresholds and then watch out for fraud, but looking at a sequence of submissions and say this actually is out of the norm. And 
having the deep learning algorithm that we bring automatically learn these patterns and then learn what's normal and what's not normal. That's very like uh, the new um, cybersecurity uh, yes. software that's entity, uh, you know, entity, entity resolution. Yeah, yes. or user behavior or entity behavior analysis, mm -hmm. where they look for not an activity on the not one item of activity on the network, but a, se a sequence of activities. That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. In psychology, we know that longitudinal studies are, you know, much more harder to do but much more you know, valuable than cross-sectional studies. Right. Well, um, we're talking about IA. I hope you, that we don't reach a day where you can get two hosts and, and run them out of the business. So <laughs> hopefully we can stop a little bit short of that, but it is a fascinating world, and uh, we really appreciate your taking the time to share with us uh, the paper, and best of luck with that, and certainly best of luck down the road with all your business endeavors. Well, th thank you for having me here. Christopher, thank you very much. Good to see you. George and I will be back with more here from the Hilton in San Francisco at Spark Summit 2016 right after this here on theCUBE.